Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your first call into the public ministry sets the stage for the rest of your career. The graduates of our church body seminary are assigned positions. The thinking is that other people are in a much better position to match our strengths with the places that have a need. It's very unusual for a seminary graduate to reject their first assignment into the ministry unless you're given a foreign assignment. I found out about my assignment the day before the rest of my classmates did. The ones assigned foreign calls are the first to find out and to respond either yes or no. Now a week Prior, each of us had met with the president of our seminary who asked us if we were willing to serve overseas. But of course, that was a much more theoretical situation than when you're actually holding the assignment. The dean of students found me in the student lounge, and as he led me away, to meet with the assignment committee, one of my dearest and closest friends said to me, Hey, it's better you than me. And he was right, of course. But still, it was a long, lonely walk across the quad to my meeting with the committee members. The committee told me, Let your wife know. Not knowing where we might end up had both my wife and I on edge. But of course, we were thinking perhaps Florida or one of the coasts. We never considered post-communist Eastern Europe as a possibility. My wife came in her car and we talked about it briefly and after about an hour. We looked at each other and said, why not? God will be with us. Uh, If I had known then what I know now about that first assignment, it would have taken me considerably more time than just one hour to sort through the decision. In fact, I might have rejected that offer completely and ended up being assigned somewhere in the upper Midwest of the United States. None of the four callings into ministry that I have accepted turned out exactly the way I thought they would. No matter how many questions you ask, there are stones you forget to look under. You can't foresee every last consequence of your decision or how you're going to react under unknown circumstances. Now, our church body teaches that the call into the public ministry comes from God. The first apostles of the church, the disciples, were chosen by Christ. And then... Other pastors were appointed by the apostles. St. Paul told the elders of the Ephesian churches that the Holy Spirit made you overseers. And thus, even though a committee of men looked at my qualifications and my record from my time spent in our synod's worker training program, and sorted very carefully through those qualifications and the needs of the churches 
that were looking for a graduate and also the mission calls that were out there. And even though after all that careful, prayerful consideration and talk, they were the ones who ultimately made that decision to give me the opportunity to serve as a missionary. God was the one who called me to that ministry. God was the one who brought me to Eastern Europe. God was the one working through that assignment committee. It's no accident that I spent the first nine and a half years of my ministry in Eastern Europe. It's no accident that I came back to the United States in 2003. Now, this teaching of the divine call is not a small thing. You know, it's not the church's way of dealing with HR issues. It's a teaching that gives real strength and courage to those who are serving in the ministry. See, that's because even though it's a holy church, the church as an organization is made up of sinners and the church is led by sinful human beings who make mistakes and then have to deal with the consequences of their actions. Now in Christianity, there's a stream of thought that when it comes to making choices, God has given you a, quote, free will that you can exercise to make either good or bad choices. Of course, this puts great responsibility on you to make the right choices. Some people seek signs from God or look to dreams for guidance on the choices they should be making. But ultimately, if the choice is ours, then God's not supreme, is he? I mean, if it's up to me to choose to serve in a particular ministry location, then what am I supposed to think when the going gets tough? And, of course, it always does get tough. Am I supposed to think that I made the wrong choice? Another stream of thought within Christianity is that God has already determined what's going to happen in advance because he knows everything and he leaves nothing to accident. I'll call it fate or destiny. What this thought means is that we human beings have no choice, and we are just part of a divinely executable program. But if God is making all the choices, then isn't he also responsible for the evil that happens? Has God sentenced me to serve him to the bitter end without complaining? Regarding this question of who makes the choice, there is a third option that allows God to remain sovereign without taking the blame for human evil. In some matters, we don't have a choice. The Bible says that the natural condition of man is that he is dead in sin. And it also speaks of coming to faith as a resurrection. You can no more choose to become a Christian than a dead person can choose to raise themselves to life. It's God's doing either way. But after that point, something changes. You have a new outlook on life and a new basis for making decisions. And with God's help, you can make the right choices. 
Sometimes the choice is an obvious one when you're choosing between good and evil. We know the commandments, don't kill, don't steal, don't spread malicious rumors, don't commit adultery. Other times, the choice is between two good things that are morally neutral. For example, do I wear a green shirt or a tan shirt today? Do I marry this girl or another one? Do we assign this graduate to foreign service, or do we keep him here in the United States? Well, as we wrestle with these choices and use our God-given reason to weigh the balance, we have God's promise that the decision we reach will ultimately serve his holy purposes as it says in the book of Romans chapter 8, all things work together for the good of those who love God. I got a second chance at foreign ministry service after I had been in public ministry for 22 years. It wasn't an assignment, but still, it was a divine call given through our church's board for African missions. It didn't take me an hour to decide, but almost two months. Why so long? Well, not because I doubt that this was a call from God, but rather because my life was much more simple at the age of 26, when I had no children and no ministry experience. Twenty-two years later, God had blessed me with the family and a wonderful stateside ministry that had great needs. So, how do you leave it all behind? Life moves in one direction. You can't go back and change the past. Neither way you decide, even though it's a choice between this good and that good, you have to live with the consequences. Well, there's no problem with God's promises. The problem lies in the weak human being. And since deciding to accept that foreign posting and arriving here in Malawi, my trust in God's promises has been tested. This is not what I expected. This is not the same mission experience I had in Bulgaria. There, I was the third missionary to arrive on the field, while here in Malawi, I am the 93rd missionary. I'm not the boy wonder I once was, if I ever was one. I don't have the close relationships with our partners here in Malawi, like my fellow missionaries do. In many situations, I find myself on the outside looking in. Do I trust that God's will is good? Does everything need to make sense to me? Must I feel useful in order to do what God wants? Do I look to the works of my own hands, the idols of my past achievements to determine my value to God. 1 John 2 verse 27 says, As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. It's not a mistake that I'm here. God doesn't pull a bait and switch. I thank God for his will, which is perfect, and for the mercy with which he treats me. I don't deserve any good thing. I should not be here. I should be dead in sin. But God 
chose me. God chose to send his son to this world. And his son knew my sins and accepted the punishment for them. His life and death is all that matters for eternity. And so every day I pray, God, please forgive me of my pride, which shows itself whenever I compare my level of cultural adjustment to others. Forgive me for questioning your purpose in bringing me here when I do not see the results I think I should be seeing and I have thoughts of what might have been if I had not come. God, your anointing is not counterfeit. Your purpose is real. Teach me to follow you in obedience and in faith for your son's sake. Now, next time on Home Ties, living in a foreign culture is stressful on many levels. And that stress exposes fault lines in your marriage. But when you're lying in a foxhole and the bullets are flying overhead, you appreciate your buddy next to you more than ever. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.